As a geochemist, I often get this question, what is geochemistry? Geochemistry, essentially, is using chemistry to understand the geological phenomena. And in this talk, we'll explore the fluid rock interaction from a geochemical perspective. Understanding fluid rock interaction is essential to subsurface energy applications, such as fossil fuel development, nuclear waste disposal, CO2 sequestration, and geothermal energy extraction. All these activities involve geochemical processes. My PhD research includes two different approaches, computational and experimental. Here I would like to share two stories to highlight each. The first story is about using computational techniques to study the interaction between oil and shale. The second story is about the experiments targeting the interaction between aqueous solutions and appetite. Part 1, Computational. This part will focus on how molecular modeling can be used to address technical challenges in shale development. First, I will give a short introduction about the shale system, the challenge to develop shale oil, and the goal of this study. The methodology will be discussed, including molecular dynamic simulation models and free energy calculation. Then the findings of this study, and I will conclude Part 1 with a summary and the takeaway messages. Shell is a sedimentary rock. It contains clay, carbonates, coals, organics, hydrocarbon fluid, etc. Although the organics in shell is around 1% in mass, its impact on oil recovery is significant. Organic phases in shell, such as calcium, can produce large pore network, generating huge surface areas. Typical pore sizes in shale range from 5 to 100 nanometers. One major challenge to develop shale oil is the low recovery factor. The average recovery rate for conventional oil is 30%. Shale oil is below 10, which means more than 90% of oil cannot be recovered from unconventional shale. The hypothesis here is that strong surface effect plays a vital role in the fluid rock interactions in shale reservoir. Due to the strong intermolecular interaction between the pore surface moleculars and the confined fluid moleculars. Assuming the effective distance for the surface interaction is three nanometer for both cylindrical and spherical pore structure. If the diameter is less than 100 nanometer, at least 12% of the confined fluid will be affected by the surface effect. This figure shows small pores have stronger surface effect, therefore less hydrocarbon can be recovered. The goal of this study is to understand the mechanism behind the oil rock interaction by calculating the interaction energy, which will lead to a better understanding of the unconventional behavior of hydrocarbon in shale reservoir. In the methodology section, I will introduce the concepts of molecular dynamic simulation models, and the free energy calculation. And here's an example of molecular dynamic simulation. One oil molecular interacting with calcite surface. This simulation is performed under periodic boundary conditions, which replicates the simulation box three-dimensionally. Therefore, periodic boundary conditions allow us to study microscopic phenomena by modeling a small system. In addition, Molecular dynamic simulation use energy term to describe the particle movement and their interactions. The first term defines the bounding distance between two bounded atoms. The second one is the bound angle of three bounded atoms. The third one is dihedral, the torsion of four bounded atoms. The last one describes Van der Waals force of non-bounded interaction for uncharged and charged particles. Based on the energy terms, the force applied to individual particles can be integrated using, using Newton's equation of motion. The coordinates and the velocities were calculated based on discrete time step. In terms of the simulation model, calcite 104 surface was chosen to represent mineral phases in shell because calcite 104 is one of the most common mineral surface. It's very well studied and has a relatively simple structure. The character surface was based on molecular fragments of type 2 character model. And in terms of oil model, 
octane and octane oil were used to represent nonpolar and polar oil compounds. Molecular clusters using 13 moleculars were also built to represent oil droplets. To characterize interaction energetic as an interface, the free energy surface, Gibbs free energy, were calculated for the oil surface interaction to evaluate, to evaluate the affinity between the oil and the surface under different conditions. On wireless sampling techniques used harmonic potential to restrain target group, which is oil in this case, at a certain distance away from the surface. A series of simulations based on different distance were performed to compute the free energy profile, which shows different energy level at a different position along the reaction coordinate. Conceptually, the reaction coordinate is the reaction pathway linking two different, state, two different states, such as oil being fully absorbed on surface and oil being far away from surface. This animation shows how umbrella potential constrains the oil molecular at a certain distance from the surface. Weighted histogram analysis method 1 can be used to convert the result into free energy profile. As shown in, the, in this diagram, each peak represents one umbrella sampling simulation, roughly 500 simulations here. The whole histogram indicates the probability of the oil molecular would stay at the different positions, and the one will convert the probability into free energy profile. This is the oil interaction with the calcium surface. Let's say distance zero is where the oil is fully absorbed on the surface. If I want to move oil away from the surface, strong interaction between oil and the surface requires higher energy input to maintain oil at this particular location. If I want to move oil much closer to the surface, there will be a strong repulsion, which requires additional energy to maintain. The difference between the plateau and the minimum is the amount of energy required for desorption. For this study, I tested four parameters, calcite versus calcium surface, surface water versus none, polar oil versus non-polar oil, and single oil molecular versus molecular cluster. The result shows at the calcite surface, polar oil requires higher energy to be desorbed than that of non-polar oil for both single oil molecular and the oil cluster. When surface water was added, something different happened. There's no plateau after minimum, just a flat line. This means in the presence of water, there's only repulsion force and no attraction between oil and the calcite. Because calcite is hydrophilic, and the strong interaction between water and the calcite prevents the oil absorption. Let's take a look at the calcium surface. Both single oil molecular and oil molecular cluster show that polar oil requires higher energy to be desorbed from calcium, which is consistent with the calcite surface. When you add the surface water, non-polar oil requires higher energy than polar oil, which is very unusual. The culprit here is obviously water. Water is a polar molecular. The SPC water model I used has a dipole moment of 2.9 dB, which is stronger than the polar oil 2.3 dB. Water could occupy the sites that have strong affinity with polar oil molecular, whereas for non-polar oil compounds, there is no difference. In summary, this study shows that, first, calcium surface has stronger interaction with oil than calcite, regardless of the presence of water. Second, polar oil generally is harder to recover than non-polar oil, mostly because of the dipole moment. Third, Surface water reduces the energy barrier for both polar and non-polar oil, making oil recovery easier. In particular, the calcite 104 is hydrophilic. If the calcite surface is fully covered by water, it loses all the interest in oil. And lastly, the oil cluster requires less energy per molecular than single oil molecular. This is mostly because of the less exposure of the oil cluster to the surface per molecular compared to single oil molecular. And here are the takeaway messages. It is harder to recover small oil clusters than large ones. Also, it is, dis it is difficult to displace oil from surfaces that are either highly hydrophilic or have rich organic content, or both. Hydrocarbon fluid cannot be treated 
as non-polar mixture, more polar comp components, more effort for oil recovery. Lastly, water can facilitate oil recovery due to its absorption on hydrophilic side of both mineral and organic phases. In summary, the computational approach uses a simplified model system to represent oil-rock interactions. The finding of this computational study are consistent with the laboratory and field observation. This approach demonstrates that molecular, di molecular dynamic simulation is capable of revealing the complex mechanism behind oil shell interaction. I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Jianwei Wang, and my colleague at LSU, Dr. Tanbach from Shell, Netherlands, Dr. Ediz from Oxford, UK, and the HPC resources provided by LSU and the NERSC. Okay, part two. Let's shift the gear from computational mode to experimental mode. In this story, I will briefly discuss the background of this study, the importance to study iodine release in appetite in aqueous environment, and the hypothesis, experimental protocol, and instrumentations, major findings, and lastly, implication for nuclear waste disposal safety. The protagonist in this story is iodine 129, a radionuclide produced during nuclear fission. Iodine 129 has an extremely long half life, 15.7 million years. Its radiation will last over 100 million years. In addition, the element iodine itself is highly mobile. Iodine species have low solubility in glass, which makes iodine unsuitable for conventional glass waste form. Radioactive iodine can be detrimental to human health. Human body concentrate iodine in thyroid. Chronic radiation by iodine can induce thyroid cancer. Because of these characteristics, iodine 1 to 9 is one of the most challenging nuclei to the disposal safety of nuclear waste. We need a concrete plan to ensure the long-term disposal safety of iodine 1 to 9. Upside structure material is a promising nuclear waste form because first, it's durable as demonstrated by natural minerals and is present in natural nuclear reactors which is over 2 billion years old. In addition, habitat is structurally and chemically flexible that can accommodate a wide range of radionuclides such as cesium, strontium, iodine, rare earth element, and actinides. For the long-term safety of nuclear waste disposal, water is the primary concern. Water can travel underground through infiltration and percolation. In a geological repository, Nuclear waste forms are packed together into a metal canister. Eventually, water will breach the canister and degrade the exposed waste form. And the radionuclides will be transported through the water cycle, reaching biosphere. It is imperative to understand how iodine 1 to 9 is released from the appetite waste form. Will the iodine release rate stay low enough to be considered safe? What is going to happen to iodine waste form during environmental degradation over hundreds, thousands, and even millions of years? This study focuses on the iodine release mechanism, especially in aqueous environment. Studies on the natural nuclear reactors and appetite mineralogy provides inspiration for this study. The hypothesis is that iodine release is controlled by the dissolution of structural matrix and the diffusion by ion exchange. Here is our sample, lead vanadinite iodide appetite, synthesized by our collaborator from RPI. A standard semi-dynamic leaching test protocol was applied to evaluate the material chemical durability. For a typical leaching experiment, a sample pellet was placed on a mesh stand in a Teflon vessel. Every 24 hours, the reacted solution was fully extracted and replaced with fresh solution. For this study, leaching tests were carried out in different solutions such as deionized water, organic pH buffer, sodium chloride, sodium carbonate, sodium phosphate, and sodium sulfate. The reactive solution was analyzed by SPMS and SCPAES to show the release rates of compositional elements. And the leached surface were examined by SEM, XRD, infrared, and Rama spectroscopy. So here are the solutions tested in this study. We have a pH-neutral solution, acidic solution, and a basic solution. For the pH-neutral solution, we use deionized water, 0.1 more per liter sodium chloride, and 0.1 more per liter sodium sulfate. For the acidic solution, I use pH 4 and 6 
organic buffer solution. For the basic solutions, I use 0.1 more per liter sodium phosphate and the sodium carbonate, which gave a pH from 10 to 11. So this is the result shows the leached surface, which are highly corroded. Some surface exhibit noticeable grain growth and possible secondary phase formation. In deionized water, iodine release is controlled by short-term diffusion and long-term dissolution. The iodine release stress can be fitted with the semi-empirical equation, which shows that the total release iodine is contributed by rapid diffusion, constant dissolution, and the surface effect due to the defect. The short-term diffusion gave a high initial release of iodine, and the iodine rate then gradually decreased to become a flat line, which suggests a constant dissolution was taking control. So when we are looking using log scale, we can see that after approximately 100 days, the diffusion rate will be lower than the constant dissolution rate. Therefore, the long-term iodine release is controlled by dissolution process. In addition, infrared spectroscopy detected hydroxyl group on the leached surface, suggesting ion exchange between OH group from water and iodide. And the XRD shows the same phases for the water leached sample and the unleashed pristine sample. So there's no secondary phase detected by XRD. In sodium chloride solutions, the iodine diffusion rate was significantly enhanced by the rapid ion exchange between chloride and iodide. The iodine rates were continuously increasing nearly one magnitude higher than the water leaching under the same condition. The XRD analysis identified the original pristine phase and the new phase, unadenite, a chlorine version of avatite, which confirms the substitution of iodide by chloride. In 0.1 more per liter sodium sulfate solution, the overall iodine release rate was accelerated compared to water leaching. The rate pattern in sodium sulfate is similar to, the, to that of deionized water, high initial, then gradually decreasing, eventually reaching a flat line. Congruent release of lead and vanadium plus identical XRD patterns to the water leaching indicates a similar mechanism, short-term diffusion and long-term dissolution process. The overall release was accelerated due to the rich ion content in the sodium sulfate solution, which gave a high ionic strength, therefore reduced the activity coefficient and the enhanced the forward reaction rate. And here are the leaching tests in acidic solution, pH 4 and pH 6 organic buffers. The iodine release in the acidics were, was mostly controlled by dissolution. The release rate are exponentially higher than the deionized water. However, the iodine rate patterns are different between pH 4 and pH 6. The rates in pH 6 are relatively constant, whereas the pH 4 rates are gradually increasing until reaching a plateau. The molar ratio of all the compositional elements in pH 6 are stoichiometric, indicating a congruent release dominated by matrix dissolution. But the ratio in pH 4 are significantly different from those in both pH 6 and water. The SEM shows extensive corrosion occurred on both pH 4 and pH 6 leached surface. In particular, I found large grain formed all over pH 4 leached surface. Rama spectroscopy identified is a new phase Keratite, lab 2 v 207 It's very interesting that the leaching behavior of iodine in these basic solutions are similar to that in the pH 4, such as iodine to vanadium, which are drastically different from water leaching and indicates formation of secondary phase. The SEM shows the sample leached by sodium carbonate and sodium phosphate have similar morphology. Large size of grains and they look like congregated. The XRD confirmed that in both sodium carbonate and sodium phosphate solution, the leached surface are covered by a new phase hydroxyl vanadonite structure. In conclusion, iodine release in aqueous environment is contributed by congruent, release, congruent dissolution of material matrix and diffusion by ion exchange. The release processes are susceptible to the solution chemistry, such as pH, ionic species, and ionic strengths. Both high and low pH can accelerate the iodine release. Small ions such as chloride can substitute iodide, leading to a rapid ion exchange and a high initial release of iodine. 
High ionic strength can reduce the activity coefficient of dissolved species and therefore increase the rate of surface reactions. In addition, secondary phase may occur such as chalotide in acid solution and hydroxymalidonide in basic solution. And two major implications for the disposal safety of appetite waste iodine waste form. First, avoid ion rich conditions, especially those ion ions that can exchange with iodide. Second, create and maintain neutral pH in repository environment to minimize the dissolution rates. I would like to thank my advisor and my colleagues from Louisiana State University, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and Argonne National Lab. This research is supported as part of WSPD, an Energy Frontier Research Center, and the Nuclear Energy University Program. Both are funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. And here's a list of accomplishments achieved through my PhD study to demonstrate that DOE's investment was not wasted on a poor graduate student. To conclude this talk, I would like to show a short film I produced for the DOE video contest last year, which earned two awards out of five, Best Writing and People's Choice. Thank you.